one of the things that's beneficial to college is that I'm at a lectern in front of the class, and to my left, as I'm looking at you, there's a big screen with Pro Tools on it. And everybody is seated at an iMac, and you can follow along with what I'm doing. And um, I saw a couple of people last week, and it looked like they were being able to have maybe a laptop and an iMac or an iPad or some sort of Surface or something, or a Chromebook or something. But if there's any way possible by like borrowing somebody else's laptop or for this class where you could be on Zoom on one laptop and follow along with that and then have Pro Tools, your Pro Tools computer open on the other one for doing some of the stuff that we're doing now. And then if you had questions as they arose, you could ask me and I could correct them on the spot like I do in class. I think that that would be helpful. So I don't know if that's possible for all you guys. I, I don't know what your situations are, but if it's possible to have and I know on a 13-inch laptop, which is what most of you probably own, it's really difficult to have both things open at the same time and be able to see anything. So if there's a way where you can borrow a second computer from a roommate or your parents or your sibling or whatever your situation is, um, your spouse if you're married or something, uh, and run Zoom on that one for the class and then follow along with Pro Tools being open, I think that that would be really a good way of... Um, learning quick more more quickly rather than me demonstrating stuff and you watching and then having to either remember it or go watch the review video and again the best way to watch the review video is on two machines with you, if all you have is a laptop um, to just borrow one and watch it on the other one and have pro tools open and stop it try to do what I did what we did in class and then figure that out and then continue on forward so um, that's basically what I would say at this point that I think would be helpful. If you can get that happening today, you can leave, you know, you can leave class and then come back. But um, if not, just however you want to handle it is fine. It's just my, my thought on this. All right. So we, I want to talk, before we do any MIDI, I want to talk about, I like to add in stuff that's just general to this topic that you'll have to understand at some point, even though we're just dealing with MIDI right now, and then we'll start dealing with audio uh, in, in a few weeks. Um, I want to touch on a subject that's really important to understand if you're going to do any kind of work with recording or MIDI or anything, and that's the subject of signal flow. So let me um, switch to a different view. Now, this material is up on our Dropbox for today's class materials, I believe. And if not, I can put up this, just this se separate PDF. Now, I, I'm showing this because this is what something that most people are familiar with. An electric guitar and an amplifier, right? Everybody's seen that. Even if you don't play guitar, you sort of can understand the concept between you take the guitar, you plug a cable here, you plug the cable into the speak amplifier and the sound, turn the volume up and turn the amp on, and the speakers, the sound comes out of the speakers. So let's dive, dive into this a little bit more in, more, more in depth. You play the guitar, you, your right hand on the guitar, either using a plectrum or your fingers, strikes a, a string or a series of strings. Your left hand is fingering the guitar to create chords or melodic passages. So when you strike the guitar with your right hand, this is very basic, it, 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 this could get on many levels, you're causing the string to vibrate, all right? And depending upon where you place your left hand on the guitar, it changes the pitch. So I could show you that with a guitar now, but I think that you all kind of get that. So if your hand is in this position, if this is the guitar neck and your hand is here playing this note, it's going to sound one pitch. And if you move it up here on the same string, it's going to sound a higher pitch because you've made the string shorter and it's vibrating faster. So let me zoom in on this so it's easier to see. 
So an electric guitar. Al, can you mute yourself, please? Never mind, I did it for you. So the electric guitar um, is different than the acoustic guitars that it has these things right here. These are called pickups. They're basically microphones. And when the string vibrates, these little microphones, they, they, a microphone is a transducer. And a transducer is something that turns one form of energy into another. So it takes the, the, the vibration, the waves and the vibration created by the string being struck and transforms it into electrical energy. Okay, so a microphone takes a sound and changes it into electrical energy. Now, the output of that electrical energy from this pickup is tiny. It's very tiny. And it goes through all the circuitry that's in the guitar and it comes out this output jack. And you plug a patch cable, a guitar cord, and this one has a quarter inch jack on it, right? Which which looks like this, right? So this gets plugged into this over here. And then the other side of it gets plugged into the input of the guitar amp. Now, that electrical signal is very small. And a guitar amplifier has, at its basic fundamental setup, a preamplifier and a power amplifier. So the signal goes into the preamplifier and it gets amplified, it gets made louder at a signal level loud enough to drive the power amp. So the signal flow is you play the note, the string vibrates, it gets picked up by the microphone, it gets changed into electrical energy, that electrical energy goes through the circuitry of the guitar, out the output jack, the output jack has the cable plugged into it, right? And then the electrical energy travels through this cable to the input of the guitar amp over here. That input then has a preamplifier set up and then it goes through the preamplifier and the preamplifier has sometimes has controls for, for, for tone. So this one has treble and bass. So you could amplify or attenuate. Attenuate means bring the volume down. The treble frequencies or the bass frequencies using this controls. That then goes into the power amplifier, which gets brought up to a level loud enough to drive the speakers. And then the sound, the speakers are also a transducer. It takes that electrical energy and changes it into way audio waves. And the speaker vibrates in and out and shoots sound, and that creates the sound that comes out of it. So that's the signal flow of a guitar into an amplifier, electric guitar. Again, one more time. You start out with the string vibrating, gets picked up, <laughs> gets caught by the pickup, and then that pickup changes that sound into electrical energy, goes out the guitar, into the preamp, out the preamp, into the power amp, out the power amp, into the speaker, then we can hear it. So that's the signal flow, how the signal flows. Now, a speaker is a transducer, and it's like kind of like a reverse microphone. And in fact, you can take a speaker and wire it in such a way that you can use it as a microphone. And very often in recording studios, when people want to emphasize bass frequencies or create an unusual effect with a microphone, they'll take a speaker, a large speaker, maybe something with a 15-inch cone, which is can transmit a lot of bass energy and they'll use that to mic something. They make these tiny these they make these small speaker microphones uh, that 
sit in front of a bass drum, a kick drum of a drum kit that specifically are there to amplify the low frequencies and they'll pick up lower frequencies than a microphone will and amplify them in a way that's different than a microphone. And so some people kind of like that, you know? So a mi speaker, a micro, a speaker is a, a, a transducer like a microphone and it can also be used as a microphone, although it's typically not, but there have been uses of these things in recording studios. Okay. So number two, basic signal flow with inserts. And I'm going to show you how, let's see. Now, in Pro Tools, we have a column here that is called inserts. All right. This is what the next bit I'm going to talk about relates to. So we've got our guitar source. And the sound goes typically from here all the way over to here. But if you notice, we have things that I have inserted into the signal path. Okay. A wah-wah pedal, an overdrive, a delay echo, and a reverb. Now, can anybody... Oh. Yes, okay, Lucienne, I got it. Um, can anybody tell me what these things are doing to the signal? Big picture. I'm modifying the yes, signal? Yes, right. So signal modifiers, right? I've got it up here, and that's exactly what they do. So the wah-wah pedal is um, an EQ sweep that as you push the wah-wah pedal up and down, it changes the frequency you hear coming out of the guitar. The overdrive adds gain and harmonics to the sound. The delay echo adds echo, echo, echo. And the reverb simulates, this is a spring reverb unit it's a picture of, it simulates the sound of a large room. So all these things change the sound and they are inserted into the signal path. So what I mean they're inserted is that the cable comes out of here and goes into here, right? So let's say this is into the guitar. This side goes into the wah-wah pedal. Then on this side of the wah-wah pedal, the same, the same procedure, a cable from here to here, then it goes through here. And then a cable from here to here, it goes through here and gets modified, the cable from here to here. This gets mod modifies the sound and it goes from here through here to here. And then again, through the preamplifier, through the power amplifier, and out the speaker. So you have the source, which is the guitar, signal modifiers inserted into the signal path to shape and change the sound. And that goes to the amplifier, which is the output. In a DAW, which is Pro Tools, Logic, GarageBand, Reaper, whatever you're going to use, your source is either an audio file or a software VI. So expand is something called a software VI. That stands for virtual instrument. So the virtual instrument, the sound comes out of that, and then it goes into, give me one second here, speaker. Okay, great. Into the DAW equivalent of these guys here, which is called plug-in inserts. This would be things like EQ, which is a tone shaping device, compression, which is a volume device, or actually... EQ is a, a volume device as well, and we won't, we'll get into these a little bit towards the end of the semester. And then that goes out the master bus to the speakers. So let me show you that in a little more detail. Hold on a second. All right. Let's leave this alone for a second. Let's go here. All right, so in a DAW like Pro Tools, right, you have an audio track or a virtual instrument track. The sound goes out of there and through the audio channel, out the audio channel through what's called the master bus. And from the master bus, it goes through the speakers or your headphones. Okay. 
Oops, hold on a sec. So in this session here, instead of having an audio file, we have a virtual instrument like Expand 2. Everybody can hear that okay? The drums? Okay, great. So I'm playing that on the keyboard, on my MIDI keyboard. And the MIDI keyboard is triggering this VI, which is inserted in the signal path of this instrument track. Then if I were to open up the mix window, which we're not really going to work on, right? The sound is going all the way through this entire chain and it's going out outputs one and two, which is connected to my speakers. It's connected to my speakers, or in this case, you're hearing it coming through Zoom. So that's the signal flow with those virtual instruments. Now, What you can do is you can insert something in, in the signal chain to shape the sound, right? So that's an e this is a filter, it's called. And this we will get into later in the semester. This is a little bit way advanced for what we're doing now, but I'm just showing you signal flow, right? And it's modifying the sound. You can see it's taking away the low frequencies. That's one thing you could put in there. Another thing you could put in here is something, a, a delay line creating echoes. Right, so I'm only playing it once and it's creating all those additional sounds. So I'm inserting that to modify the sound in the signal path. All right. Now, the reason that this understanding this stuff is important is that once you start getting into multiple tracks, so notice here I've got four tracks in this particular piece, which we're going to look at in a minute. All, all the audio from all those tracks gets added together it's math, sum, summed together, and it comes out the master bus before the speakers. And if the sound from all of these, the aggregate sound of all of these is too loud, it will create distortion. So you have to write at the beginning, I want you to be concerned with that you're not, if you've got this meter open, that when all four of these tracks are playing simultaneously, They're not pushing the meter up into the red. So let me just show you how that would happen. So if I were to just really, I don't recommend doing this, but if I were to really you see right there, this is up in the red now and it's distorting. Not good. So once you start having multiple tracks together, just be aware of the overall volume of them coming out of here. And if when using MIDI tracks, let me expand these. Now, let me just sh start showing you some key commands also. All right, so if I wanna make all the tracks in a piece larger, I hold down, the control and option, and I push the upward facing arrow. See how they all get bigger at the same time. And if I want to make them Can smaller, you repeat that, please? yep, control and option, and then the upward facing arrow makes them bigger, and the downward facing arrow makes them smaller. Yeah, see, Matthew's using two computers, or I think, right? Or a, a pad and a computer and he has Pro Tools open. Yeah, see, so he's able to follow along just like it's the regular class. 
and it works out oh. well. What are you What are you using? What are your two devices, Matthew? Um. Yeah. No. I mean, I'm I'm on class on my iPad, and I'm right. I'm doing Pro Tools. Right. So that that works. Actually, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Totally unrelated, but this is so weird. Every time I I plug my MIDI controller in, like. It, it, it like does something different. Like today, it's not being recognized by Pro Tools at all. Um, right. So do you have? So you're using a Windows machine, correct? Yeah. So do you have the drivers set installed for your? Yeah, I do. I mean, it works well in Reaper. Just I don't know. It's all right. I'm gonna have to do some research on that for you. All right. Okay. Let me just put. Right. That, let me Sorry, just. Put, no, that's all right. Every time you unplug your MIDI controller, you have to restart. I looked it up. Oh, okay. So that's a PC thing. So anytime you unplug a MIDI controller, you have to restart Pro Tools. Did you hear that? Great design. It's weird because I don't have that problem with uh, in in the Mac. So um... no, it's just it's just us poor Windows people. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I have to tell you though, you can get a much more powerful computer, a Windows computer, than a Mac for much less money, and there's nothing wrong with Windows computers. I may switch over to them right. at some point because they're just, you know, the whole Apple thing is like so expensive. Um, but thank you, though. I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. All right. But that what, his setup there works really well because he's able to follow along and then do this stuff. So that if you can get that set up by next week, um, borrowing a laptop from somebody or if you can't just, you know, keep on. And also, um, there was one person last week that didn't have a MIDI keyboard. Justin has been notified, and he should get in touch with you uh, at some point soon. I think that's Richard Mendoza, I believe. Is that correct, Richard? So, all right. So that's the key command for that. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And... We're going to move ahead and talk about doing some editing. So this is uh, this is up in our Dropbox. If you can follow along, this is up here. Go to the fundamentals class materials for class three. Right here. 92120. You can download this and open this up and follow along with this session. It's got today's date on it. So I've got a little piece I put together here, and we're going to work on making it better. It's a little sloppy, and we're going to just work on some of the techniques to clean up this track. <laughs> Okay, so you can hear how that sounds. It's okay. Now, one thing I want to show you is that I've got the tracks ordered in a certain way. In most recording sessions for pop music, the drums are usually on the at the far left of the um, of a twenty four track machine. But now we're in digital. It, the equivalent of that is to have it on the top most portion of your edit window. And then I've got the bass right under that, then the piano, and then the pad. So I've got my rhythm section grouped together, and then my extra instrument. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the setup window, and I want to make sure that this is set up in preferences. So we go to preferences, and I want you to make sure that the color coding, which is right here, always displays marker colors, and MIDI note shows velocity, but we want our default track color coding to be tracks and MIDI channels and our default clip color coding to be track color. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to take a screenshot of this. All right. And then I'm going to pop this into the chat. Oops.
Uh, Matthew, it's 921. It's got the date on it. It's up in Dropbox in our class three. File. My computer. Screenshot. Great. Okay, so if you want to take it, if you want to download that, you can have that. Okay. Now, default track color coding tracks and MIDI channels. We will color code them, and the clips inside of the track will def have the same color as the track itself. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if you notice now, these are all the, the Pro Tools default colors. So if I double click on this bar over here on the left-hand side of Pro Tools uh, edit window here, it opens up a palette, right? And I can click on that and change the color of that track. Now, this is probably what yours will end up looking like, something like this. If you click right here on this rainbow, you could turn up the saturation and you can play around with the brightness. I think that you could play around with the brightness irrespective of the saturation being open. So you can make Pro Tools look really dark or you can make it look a little bit lighter. And if you click on this, you can have the whole area be colored from here all the way over to here. If you turn that off, this pretty much stays the same color and just your tracks are colored. I like to have a little bit of saturation. I don't like it to be garish and oversaturated, but just like that. Can and you just show where you clicked? I'm sorry. That's all right. Please ask questions. So to get the palette? Yeah. Okay. So do you see where my mouse is over here on the left-hand side of the screen? So let's say I'll do another track. I'll click here and I just double click like that and it opens up the, the color palette. Thank you. Sure. So I'm going to do, I'll do this again. So when you guys, it defaults, make sure it says tracks right here. All right. So if I just click default, then you can change the brightness of this area here and to set it up to your liking. Some people may like it dark like that. Some people may like it very bright like that. I like it somewhere in the middle. And then if you click on this little rainbow right here, this area gets colored as well as the track. And then you've got all these different colors that you can make your tracks. And if you turn the saturation up, like with a color like that, you see how this area gets very saturated and if you like that, that's great. It's not a problem for me. You do whatever makes you feel good. I like it to be a little bit more pastelish, so I bring it down a little bit. So I'm going to um, color my tracks. I'll tell you, a color like this, like bright yellow, I would avoid bright yellow, lime, bright green. Some of these lighter tracks that are very bright, I would avoid those because what ends up happening when we go to the MIDI editor those, um, when we go to the MIDI editor, all the notes are very bright and they're really, it's very difficult to see them on the editing window. So I would avoid some of those. If all you're doing is audio files, that's fine. But when you're doing MIDI tracks and MIDI clips, then I would avoid those. So if you wanted to do yellow, I would make it a little bit more gold or the middle one. If you wanted to do green, I would keep it down in this area as opposed to that area. So that's just uh, with these colors in this area here. That's a little aside. And then my pad, I'm going to, I'll make it that color pink. And then I can close this out. All right. So I want to listen to the drums and see what they sound like. So to just listen to the drums by themselves, right here, there's a little button that says S. That's the solo button. So if I click on that and I hit return, I'll go back to the beginning of the track. I'll play, you'll only hear the drums. Okay. So I want to look at that and see if that's, if that is sounds good and is edited well. So there's two, there's in Pro Tools, there are multiple ways to do everything in Logic, in Reaper, in Cubase, in Ableton, there are always multiple ways 
to do things. And you may find one way suits your workflow better than the other. You may find sometimes one way is better and other times a different way is better. So it's really good to know as many ways as possible to do things. But at the beginning, that gets to be really overwhelming. So what I'd like to do is just, I'm going to tell you what to do. All right. So I'm going to make this screen bigger. Now, right here on the lower left-hand corner of this gray area, there is a, lo a line with an upward-facing arrow. If you click on that, a new window is going to open up inside of the edit window. And this is the MIDI editor. Now, if you don't like that, you can go to Window here, and you see that there is a MIDI editor here, which is a separate floating window. Now, for me, if I'm working on a track, I might keep this big window because it's easy to see everything open on a second monitor. But you guys have, you know, you want to maximize your space. Um, so this is, it's a bit much. So I would suggest to work in the MIDI editor. Now, if it comes looking like this, you need to see your list with your tracks in it, which is this up and down line with a right facing uh, um, arrow. So I'll just click on that and it opens it up. So let's take a look at resizing everything to make it really more uh, beneficial for you. Now, understanding how to navigate the GUI and to get all around the software is really an essential part of getting this to be that it's not cumbersome to work. So that's why I said this in the first class that knowing where things are and what things do when you're first learning a new piece of software will really, in the long term, speed up your workflow. So it's good to start doing that right at the beginning. So what right here we have is the tracks list. So this has a list of all the tracks. Now, you can see that right here there's a column with some dots. I'll get to that in a second. But right here you can see that there's colors, right? So it tells you that this is color coded, but they don't match the colors of these tracks here. So it's hard to see, I know, on the small screen, but right here next to the left of the drum, it's got a red. So what you want to do is click on this little palette here until they are the same color as your tracks. And this way, the notes in here will be the same color as your tracks, so you'll be able to easily know what instrument you're working on. So, and then after the color um, column, you've got this column here, and if you look, that's a little orange box with what looks to be piano keyboards in there. That lets you know that that's an instrument track. All right, so when we open an audio track, you'll see that that looks differently. And then to the left, you will get the name of the track and the number of the track if you've got numbers set up, which I do, track number. Don't worry about that right now. I'll go over view in, in a future class. But So if I want to edit the drums, I can click right here on this little dot and the drums are here. You can't see them because the, the, I'd have to scroll down, right? And basically what I'm doing, let me show you the mouse action that I'm doing here. So basically, I've got the scroll wheel here, and if it's if the mouse is in this field, the cursor, I can scroll up and down. Alternatively, on the very far right-hand side, oh, you can't see this because of me. Let's do this. Okay. Okay, the thing's not there, but on the tracks window right here, you can, there's a bar that you can scroll up and down. Now, this looks really small and hard to see. If you have this little button here turned on, and it's amber, you can use the T key to zoom in and the R key on your computer to zoom out. 
alternatively, if I do this, I, I move my mouse and I'm, this, I'm on this area, this gray area here that's called the ruler. I click and drag to the right all the way to the beginning. If I do control option and the letter F, it fits all those notes in the window. What, which button needs to be colored amber in order to do those It's controls? on the upper right hand side of the, of that little MIDI editor and it's got the letter A and Z on it. Hmm. Do you see on your, nice. are, right? Do you, let me just move this so that I'm out of the way. Yeah, I think, I think I got that. It's right cool. here, Matthew, it's right here. And also yeah. on the edit window, it's up here. Now, let me just show you another trick. If you turn it on here, if you're working in the MIDI editor, it automatically does it. And the way that you know whether the MIDI editor is active or the edit page is active is that there is a gold yellowish line around the toolbar for the active window pane. So if I'm down here in the MIDI editor around this toolbar here, there's a gold line. So again, me, knowing all of these little details, it seems overwhelming, but if you do this, you know, over time, you'll learn all these things. It's not that difficult. It's just, it's a lot for right now. So let's take a look at what we've got here. We've got our drum track. Now, we can change the size of the edit, edit window. Let me make this a little bit down here. If we hover right in this area here, the mouse turns to a cross. You can click and drag up and it will resize that. So you can make it pretty big, which is nice. You can see everything. Now, let me go over these tools on the toolbar again, because you can see that they're the same, some of them are the same as up here. This is MIDI, so we don't need some of this stuff here. Now, if you want to make these notes here fatter or skinnier, there's a little box right up here, right below the A and Z. If you click on the top of that box, the bottom, it'll get skinnier, and on the top of that box, they'll get bigger. So there's this little box with two lines in it. The bottom of it will make them skinnier. This is helpful if you've got notes that are a wide variety of pitches. And then this will make them fatter. And I would suggest for this to make them as fat as possible so that you could see them. So this right here is the zoomer tool. We don't need to use that because we've got R and T set up. So we're in good shape with that. Less mouse clicks. This is the trim tool. We're going to be using the trim tool. This is the selector tool. We're going to be using that. This is the grabber. And this is the line. So those are the ones that we're going to be using. The trim, the selector, the grabber, and the line. All right. Now, there's a couple of ways to navigate. You can, for right now, just click on it, and it'll turn blue. And that means that that tool is active. And I'm going to show you how we're going to use that. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Now, you could see on the top here, let's go back to the beginning. This line up here, let's stay on this. This line up here, this is your, this gray line up here. And I wish I could make this wider, you know, this way, wider, but it's, it's stuck at this size. So this is our timeline. And you'll see we've got one, one with three zeros. That means... Bar one, beat one. Then over here, we've got bar one, beat two. Over here, we've got bar one, beat three. And in the middle of that, there are the subdivisions. Right now, we're seeing 480 and 480. Now, we're not seeing anything in the grid. Can anybody tell me why we're not seeing anything in the grid right now? There's one very easy reason, and I want somebody to be able to figure that out. Okay. I will tell you this and you will know it forevermore. <laughs>
So right here, do you see where it says the word grid? It is blacked out with the letter with the word grid in lime green. Click on that and it becomes reversed. The letters are black and the box is lime green. That means you've turned on the grid. And as you can see, as I'm hovering over that, the help tool says show grid lines. So now you could see that we've got a darker blue on every beat and lighter blues for the subdivisions. I've got this set up to 240 ticks, which is a 16th note, because there are 16th notes in here, right? There are 16th notes. You can see that they line, that they're sort of on these grids. Now, I don't think that what I'm going to teach you right now is the best thing to do musically, but this is an exercise for you to learn how to use this technique. So right now we're going to work on snapping notes to the grid manually. There's a way to do this by just pushing a couple of buttons, which I will show you next week. But right now I want you to do things manually because I want you to learn how to use the tools because there are times when you just want to do a couple of, a couple of little tweaks. And um, there are times when you want to do just a couple of little tweaks and not everything all at once. All right, so let me go back so you can see the mouse. So I've got the trimmer tool set up. And this note right here, if I zoom in a little further, a little closer, you can see that this note here starts before the grid. I played it a little early. So if I want to make that perfect, which again is not always the best thing musically, Luciana, did you have a question? Or were you just waving your hand? Yeah, sorry, no. Um, I can't seem to get the notes to show up at that, um, the smaller piano or like the smaller keyboard. I think I missed the step. Okay, so can you, uh, is this window open on yours? So, you know what? Yeah, I'm, okay. but I just don't have anything. There. Okay, so is, is this tracks list open on yours? Yeah, with the correct colors. Yep, and then did you click this little black dot to the left of the drum name. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. All right. There's another way of doing that that's easier, but I got to I have to show you how to use this area. It's so important in the long in the big picture of working in pro tools. Okay. So now to fix this note to have it go right on beat 2, I've got my trimmer tool and I'm just going to snap right here anywhere just to the left of beat two, and it will snap right to grid. Okay, and then right here, this note, I'm just gonna snap that there. This one, I could see this one's a little early. This one's a little early. That one's way early. This one's late. So again, with this one, I'm a, right around here, and if I click, it will just snap right to grid. And then I can just go through this really quickly and just fix all these. Again, I don't think this is the most musical thing, but I want you to learn how to do this stuff so that you understand when you need to do just a couple of notes, you can just fix a couple of notes. You see, I could quickly just run through all those notes. So let me show you again with a, a badly played note. Okay, so right here. And... To scroll left and right, I've got my finger on the wheel, or if you've got a, let's see, do I have my, I don't know if my mouse pad is, no, my mouse is not hooked up, is it? My trackpad? Yeah, it is, but for some reason it's not working. All right, let's forget about my trackpad. But you on your laptop, you can scroll with your trackpad. So this note is way early. I want it to line up with this grid right here. So I just click, yeah, connection lost. Uh, and it will snap to it. And on my mouse, I'm just using the scroll reel to, to move left and right. And I'm just correcting all these. Some of these notes are too short, so I'm just clicking and dragging them. 
So I can also change the duration of a note, even though on a drum it doesn't really matter. So in other words, if I click here and drag to the left, right, I can change the duration of the note. All right, so now, Okay, so all of a sudden, there's no drums, right? We need more drums. So I want to take this drums and have it last for the rest of the session. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go, I like to go from just past the area. So I'm at bar, this ends at the at the beginning of bar five. So I'm on bar five. Let me make that bigger for you. And let me, uh, I'm going to close this for right now so you can see this. Let's see. Let me make this really big. Okay, so I'm on bar five. I'm using the selector tool, which is up here. I'm going to click right here. I'm going to click here, not right click here. I'm going to click here and I'm going to drag all the way to the beginning of the piece so that that area is selected. Now there's two ways, two key commands that I want you to learn for increasing the length of this. The first one is duplicate, right? So that is command and the letter D like dog. And you could just do that multiple times. Then there's option R, which brings up the repeat so the number repeats, I want it to repeat twice, let's say, and boom, see it does that. You could always copy, and there's more ways to do this also. Those are the quickest ways, just Command D. Now, other ways to do this. Option, use the grabber. Option, click, and then just drag, right? And that will duplicate. But see, now that becomes an issue because I didn't put this in the right spot. This is early. So I messed that up. <laughs> All right. So let's do it the way that I taught. So now we've got drums to the end, even though they don't really, there's a little figure at the end, which we'll figure out later, figure that we'll figure out <laughs> later. At least now we've got drums through the whole piece. How did you, um, I get how to select it. How did you duplicate it? Okay, so let me do it. I'll do it one more time. It's not a problem. I'm always happy to do, so you've, you've selected measures one through one through five, right? So it's four bars selected. Richard, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. All right, use the, like the key command, the command key, which is this one here on, on Mac, and then the letter D, like dog, and then it duplicates okay, it. command D. Thank you. And then you could do that multiple times. So you're going to do it twice right now. Okay. And then how do you like combine them into one, um, one roll? Oh, make those three, one, those three clips. One, right. uh, I could sure I could teach you that. So if you notice that these three are three separate clips right now, one clip, the second clip and the third clip. One thing I want to show you before I do that is you notice that this one says right up here, drums slash zero six on mine. That's the name of that clip. And notice on the second one, it has the same thing. And on the third one, it has the same thing. So this is basically the same clip. It's, they didn't create a new clip. They just put the, put the copy of that second one here and the first one here and a copy of it here without renaming it. So if you want to combine that all into one clip, I'm got using the grabber tool or you can use the selector tool and double click and then hold the shift key down and then double click again on the first one and see how all of them are selected. Right. right. Or you can use the grabber tool and just click, hold the shift key down and then click on all of them. I believe the key command is option shift and the number three, but see, here's the problem with this. Uh, you have to have an expanded key keypad to do this one with the key command like that okay but but you can go to edit 
and you can go all the way down to what's called consolidate clip. And it does it, that's what you're doing with that key command. So like I said, there's multiple ways to do the same function in this, in every DAW. Okay. I have a question regarding um, what you just talked about. Um, yes, no. Oh, first of all, uh, I did actually, I think the option shift three works as well on the regular. Oh, it does? I because tried. I yeah, know because I does. know that these have much different functions than this. Uh, let me just see. Right. I just tried it on my Yes, Mac. it does work. Okay. It does, yeah. But um, there are. But my th question was actually, <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Um, um, basically, I, I figured that out by myself, the, 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 um, the duplicate uh, with the command D. Um, but um, my issue was basically when I select, I wanted to lock it, lock it to a grid. So I'm not like seven measures and, you know, uh, three quarters and I didn't pay attention. There's like a tiny bit, okay. you know, so here, here, of uh, right. okay. eighth notes and I copy it. Right. So basically, I'm going to undo all this. Okay. So this is where we are, right? So one way to do it so you only get one measure always is to take your grid and make it one bar, the resolution of the grid. So I'm always adjusting the resolution of my grid. And this way, I can't do anything that's in the middle of a bar, right? So I'm only picking these bars like this. All right, does that help? Let me do it one more time. Up here yes. in the grid area, you click on this downward facing triangle here and you can select how big the grid is. Now on the edit window, I would probably leave it at a quarter note and higher, right? As a general rule, for what we're doing, that should probably be sufficient. But if you just wanna make sure that you can only select an entire measure, you could bring it all the way up to the top so that it's one bar. And then you could just click and drag and you will only select a single measure. You won't be able to select a, a bar and an eighth note, four bars and an eighth note. Does that make sense? No? Uh, it, it does, but I, even when I press it, when I have my mouse over it, it it's still going to choose a random part. Like I could do like from measure 19. Okay. Do you have, do you have, do you have, do you have the grid enabled? This. um no uh, yeah. yes it is it's it's it is yeah it is enabled so and it's on one bar for now for example right so so then you can only select so i'm just clicking and i'm following up here on this part of the timeline that's letting me know where the what bars and beats i'm at right here and if i click here i look on the counter i can also see right there where i'm starting and if i click and drag you see the counter goes all the way back to one but if you look right here, it will tell you everything that you selected. Mm -hmm. So I've only selected four I bars see. now. It's okay. impossible for me to select four and a half bars when that grid is at one. I see. It's only possible to select an entire measure. Now, if you wanted to select <clears throat> four and a half bars, then you would select set it to, <clears throat> to two beats or half note and then you can get in between each bar for a half note so then once that's selected you could just duplicate that twice and then if you want to consolidate that i learned something today thank you very much uh, with the top keyboard here being okay for that particular command although these notes here do have a different function these keyboards here uh, th these expanded uh, keypad Okay, so now let's take a look at our base. So I'm gonna, now if I highlight the base, right, by clicking over here and I open this up, you'll see that we still have our drums. <laughs> that is because we've got this target mode set off and I don't wanna um, turn it off. I don't wanna talk about that yet, but what we'll do here is if I click on the bass, you're going to see that there's the bass and the drums, right? So to get rid of the drums, you would click on the dot here to the left of the drums, and then you would only see the bass. So let me go over that again. I want to hear the bass, and I want to edit the bass. So I'm going to click on this little dot right here to 
activate the bass, and you'll see that there's bass and drums. Now, you can edit both the bass and the drums at the same time if you get good enough at MIDI editing, and sometimes I might have three or four instruments open in here and editing them because I've got them color-coded so I can see who's playing what. And that's another reason why color coding is so great. But that's a little confusing for like, you know, your third class. So let's just get rid of the drums by clicking right here on that little dot. And the drums are taken away from our view. Okay, so our bass. Now a bass, I'm going to solo this. To solo the bass, it's one of two things. You can either solo it here. And you see the S becomes highlighted here. Or if you click on the S here, you see that the S becomes highlighted here, becomes yellow, and that solos the bass. So now we should just be able to hear the bass. Now, we could see here that a lot of these notes are before the grid. So we're going to keep our grid at 240 or a 16th note, and I'm just going to snap these all to the grid. Again, this might not be the best way to do this. I'm going to leave this one alone for the time being. I want to show you something else. But I'm going to just snap. So I've just snapped the first bar, and I'm going to play that again. Now, the reason I left this one alone is that if I snap it to the grid, it makes it really short. And I actually like the length of that note. So if I want to get this on the grid, I can use the grabber tool and just click and drag it here like that. All right. And this one seems to be late, so I'm going to drag that in. I'm just going to drag that over to the beginning of the bar. So now let me show you a couple of shortcuts. So remember how I used the grabber tool for this one here? I've got two of those, like, little... Um, ghost notes, they're called, here, if I just click and drag across that with the grabber, I can take both of these and move them, and they'll be close to the grid. And the same thing, you see all of these notes are off the grid. If I click and drag, I can move all of those like that, and then they might not all be on the grid, but some of them, they'll be closer, and you could just click, and instead of using the trimmer tool, you can also just click and drag them onto the grid like that. So that's another way to do it, and that was pretty quick. Okay, now, the first two measures sound good. The second two measures don't sound so good. I could go on and edit the second two measures, but they're the exact same musical material as the first two measures. So I'm just going to click and drag and select all of this, and I'm going to use Command-D again. So rather than editing everything, I just duplicated it. It's the same part. So now our drums and bass sound, they'll probably sound very tight. Going forward, it gets off, but we're just going to work right here at the beginning of this. Now, one other thing I want you to get used to thinking about is the volume of instruments. So I don't know how this is going to play out on Zoom. But the bass is way too loud. So we need to turn the volume of the bass down. Now, in Pro Tools, there are several kinds of volume. There's, but the two that we're going to talk about right now are MIDI volume and audio volume. So if the bass is too loud, a lot of you will look at this right here and you will and you'll take this right here and you'll drag it down like that. And that will reduce the volume. 
So that sounds more balanced to me. There are other concerns as to why not. that's not the best route to go right now. And it has to do with gain staging, and I will get into that in a later class. But for right now, on instrument tracks, we are going to use this volume control right here to get an overall level. So you just click and drag this down. Now, how do I know what the right volume is? The right volume for an instrument in a track is track dependent. It depends upon the material that's in the track. So what I might think is the right volume for bass on this track might not be the right volume of bass on a different stylistic track. So for this track, I want to be able to hear the kick drum very clearly, and I want to be able to hear the bass as well. And if the bass is too loud, it covers up the kick drum. You can still hear it, but they're, f they're fighting each other. So this is like a sensitivity thing where I want you to start thinking about the relationships of instruments to each other. And that's learning how to listen into a sound. So if you're listening to, uh, for example... If you're listening to a piece of music, I, I like what what is what do you listen to when you listen to a piece of music? For most singers, it's the lyrics and the vocalists. For most drummers, they listen to the drums. For most bass players, they listen to the bass. For most pe keyboard players, they listen to the keyboards. But for doing this and learning how to make something that sounds good. You have to expand that and develop a deeper appreciation, a deeper method of listening. So a story I always like to relate is that when, and if I told you guys this in the last class, um, please for, indulge me, is that when John Coltrane wanted to learn a piece of music, he would get a recording because it's not like learning classical music where you can go out and buy a score although now there's plenty of transcription books that you can purchase, but back when he was alive in the 1950s and 60s, there weren't. And what John would do would be <clears throat> he'd listen to the whole piece and just get an overview of the whole piece without focusing in on anything in specifically. And then he'd start with the, the bass line usually, and he would listen to the bass line from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece, and he would just listen and focus in on what the bass player was doing until he could almost sing the entire bass line from the beginning to the end. Then he'd go back and he'd listen to just the drums. And he'd listen to the drums and he'd learn the drums. He'd listen to over and over again, just focusing in on the drums until he knew what every fill was and he could really hear the detail of what the drummer was playing. Then he would listen to how the drums and the bass interacted together, right? So how they fit together as a rhythmic unit, how they accented things together, their dynamics, what the balance was between the volume of the bass and the volume of the drum kit. And then he would do this with all of the different instruments, and he would finally get to the melody instrument, the saxophone or whatever he was listening to. That would be kind of the last thing he did. But basically, he would go through the piece methodically, instrument by instrument, until he learned what each instrument was doing. And if he, he, pro he might have written things out, I don't know, but he could certainly sing back what they were doing and internalize and study the piece of music like that so that when you're listening to music with your earbuds, instead of just listening to the melody and the voice, start focusing in on how the bass and the bass and the, and the drums fit together. What instruments is the rhythm of the bass fitting in with the drum kit? Most often, it's definitely fitting in with the kick drum. And if you don't know what the kick drum is, it's the big round drum that sits on the floor that has a pedal that the drummer pushes down and it takes a beater and slaps it up against the drum. And that's called either the bass drum or the kick drum. The hi-hat is the drum on the cymbals that are on, usually on, if the drummer's right-handed, they're on his right-hand side or her right-hand side. And they keep time on that for pop music. The snare drum is the round drum that's right in front of their body and they play that usually with their left hand if they're right-handed. And then you've got other drums 
that are on top of the bass drum and maybe over on the side, those are tom-toms, they're called. Those are deeper, richer drums. The snare drum is a snappy drum, and it usually plays what's called the backbeat. And then you've got cymbals, metal discs. You've got a cymbal that's usually on the right-hand side. That's called the ride cymbal. That's where usually they're playing time figures. And then the other cymbals they've got are called crash cymbals. Those are done for doing accents. So these are things that you should be aware of if you're trying to sequence music with rhythm section stuff, which most of you will be doing, is to understand the different instruments in the drum kit and how they work together. But for right now, what I want to tell you is that the kick drum is usually the heartbeat. It relates to something in Afro-Cuban music called the clave, which I'll get into at some point in the future, but it has to lock in typically with what the bass player is doing. And so, right here, I can't hear, I can hear the kick drum, but I can't really hear it cleanly. So the bass drum is taking over too much of the lower frequencies in the sound field of this track, and that's where the kick drum also lives. So I'm going to bring the volume down and I'm going to just, so I'm, I'm clicking on this volume slider and I'm just dragging it down. And I found just randomly, I put it to 70. Can you reach me screen? I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. You Thank you for reminding me. I get so involved in talking sometimes that, uh, I forget. Thank you. Please do that. If I do that again, don't feel hesitant. <laughs> okay. You know, it's from nine years of teaching in, in at school with not having to switch back and forth between cameras and, you know, two cameras and uh, a, a screen share and different views and stuff. I'll get that together. All right. So right here, we're at volume 127 and it's too loud. So I'm going to click and drag that down. And I originally thought 70 sounded good, but now I'm thinking maybe about 75. If, and again, if it's 76 or 77 or 73 or 74, at, at the level that you're working at, approximately like that, within a, a, a number or two, is not going to make that big a difference. So now I can hear all the kick drum, the really snappy part of the kick drum, and I can hear the bass. Now there's other things to the bass that are a little weak, in terms of the timbre, but in terms of the balance between the two of them, that's pretty good. All right, so piano. Let's solo the piano and take a listen to that. Let's open up our editor and we'll select piano and unselect the bass. Yes, somebody have a question? Now you see, look, look at the disgusting color that green is. It looks like bad pea soup. So I'm going to change the color of that because I can't stand it. That's a little better. All right. Now. What I would say with the piano is that you don't have to get every note right on the beat, but some of them should be there. So what I would tend to do with this track would be, and since there's very little left hand, this is mostly done with my right hand, I would just grab that and just slide the whole thing over so that some of it is right on the beat, but not everything. You can see that some of these are not on the beat, but one is, but the aggregate sound will, will sound much better. So I'm just going to drag, and you can actually... Like, these all look like they're about the same distance, so you could just grab these three and drag them all over like that. That's a little early. These look fine. So you could just go through, and if we just uh, solo the, that, the drums and the bass... You could see that that sounds much more in the pocket, right? Do you have a question, Caitlin? 
Um, I don't know if it like really pertains to like what you're about to show, but like, um, say like you don't want the MIDI editor to 100% line up with your grid. Like you don't want it to be directly in line. Like you were just saying before, some of it's not directly in line. Is there a way to like get that? Yes. Like, when you drag, it automatically snaps. Not yeah. all, but not all of those notes snapped, right? The one that you want, one of them snapped. So let me just show you what I mean by that. Let me get one that hasn't been done yet. All right, give me one second. So I'm going to make this so that it's worse, right? So I'm going to select all these, and I'm going to drag this over. You notice the note that I selected got lined up to the grid. Let me just show you that. So I'm hovering over the second note from the bottom. If I click and drag, that one gets on the grid and the rest don't. So if I go here, notice the top note gets right on the grid, but the other ones don't. Now, if you want to manually do this, this is a little bit more advanced, and I don't typically teach this right at the beginning, but you asked, so I'll show. Right here, there and the there are things called grid modes. These four right here, and they correlate to these four up here in the edit window. You could go to the second one, here, this one right here, which is called slip, and that will let you move things freely, and you can place them wherever you want. Okay. All right, but for right now, let's just stick with getting these things on the grid. But yes, there is a way to do that. So, like, you see, some of these are pretty good, so I'm not going to touch them. So, and overall, this will sound a little bit tighter. Okay. Now. Now, I'm going to listen to this with everything playing. So, for right now, I want you to listen to the piano and this purple sound, which is a pad, it's called. It's kind of like a choir. And listen to this, and I'm hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll translate over Zoom. And listen to that and the relationship of those two sounds to the volume of the drums and the bass. We have the drums and the bass sounding good volume-wise. Listen, are these sounds too loud, too soft, or just right? Do they dominate the track so much that they take your attention away that you have to really struggle to hear the bass and the drums, or is everything easy to hear? Anybody want to venture to take a guess? I'll play it one more time. The question was regarding the bass. The question was regarding... All right, let's 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 make it even simpler. Is the piano... Wait, what was the question? Okay, one more time. I'll do it one more time. So we'll just okay. do it with the piano, all right? And um, is the volume of the piano too loud? And does it... When you listen to it in conjunction with the bass and the drums. So in other words, is does the piano overtake and make it harder, too hard to hear the bass and the drums or is it too soft, or is it just right? So I want you to know, is the piano too loud in this mix, too soft, or just right? So I've muted the pad, so we're just gonna focus in on the piano. I think it's all right. Okay. It I could I, it could it could be all right for me personally. I, it's a it's a little it's, it's a little I was bit gonna say the piano. Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. I was gonna say the piano is actually a little loud. Exactly. For me the piano and this this might be a zoom thing where your speakers and what you're listening on may affect it, but here on my system, the piano's too loud because I it's hard for me to hear the bass and the kick drum. I can hear all the snappy, like the sim the hi hats and the snare drum on the drum kit, but it's harder for me to hear the 
bass. I, so I'm going to bring I that. Feel like, Go ahead. I feel like for piano, at least for this thing, it, it's interesting. It's not like it's playing a single line melody or something you necessarily want to stick out. It's almost like it's playing, it's playing the accompaniment in, in a way. Everything here is sort of accompaniment, but I think this piano part, if it's too loud, it just, it sticks out and it sort of sounds like clunky and weird. Right. So it's supposed to lock yeah. in with the hi-hat on the drum. Right. So as I bring the volume of the piano down, you see that? How it fits in much better now? And now you can hear the bass. Right? This is before. And this is after. You definitely hear more of the bass. Now, right? Yeah. Yeah, you could so, hear like so, the, the higher notes in the bass as well that you wouldn't be able to hear normally when the piano was a little louder. Right, so you see the relationship between instruments, right? And that's that. If you can't hear that right now, don't worry about it. it, it you just have to start thinking in those terms and realize that Rome wasn't built in a day, and that as if you work at this over time, you'll develop that sensitivity. You'll start hearing things that you wish you didn't hear. Um, <laughs> trust me. Also, too, I've played bass instruments my whole life too. There you go. All right, so now let's go to our pad. Now, with the pad, this doesn't really need to be gridded because it's it's sort of like a loose kind of a sound, right? Whoops, I opened up the big window. Let's uh, go down here. So I think this one you would leave alone. Let's solo this. It's funny. So if you watch the playback head, so you know that the line that moves from left to right while it's while Pro Tools is playing this line here, that's called the playback head, all right, or the cursor. The sound almost happens, even though the notes are right on the beat or close to where the downbeat is, the sound sort of swells in because it's got a long attack. So having that kind of gridded is not really that necessary. So what we can do, though, is listen to the volume with everything else. And again, too loud. So we're going to leave this right here for right now. And what I'd like for you to do for next week is to take this piece and finish the editing on the piano and bass and drum track, all right, for timing, using a combination of dragging, you know, selecting and dragging, the trimmer tool, and... Um, yeah, those two, those two things. So we're going to do it manually, and then next week I'll show you how to do it um, more automatically. But it'll give you a good workout using the mouse with the trimmer tool and the grabber tool. Now, let me just go over one thing again. Whoops, let's get back to this guy here. So if I wanted to select a series of notes, let's say I wanted to select these, these guys here, but not this lower note here. So I'm talking about the, the, these guys, these guys, and these guys. I would click, so I'm starting a little bit beforehand, and I'm just dragging diagonally. You can see what I'm doing with the mouse, right? I'm being careful. And so notice those are all selected. So I can just move all those together and snap them to the grid. So that should save you some a lot of time. It should basically take you like about an hour and a half to two hours to do this whole thing over the next week. 
Um, so it's not that it's not a, a ton of work, but what I want you to get done is color setup, learn how to select the different tracks in the tracks lists here. And then do your editing. Oh, and also to copy and paste and move out the drum track so that it's the right length. So I would edit the drum track first and make sure that it's in time and then do the uh, duplicate, right? So don't duplicate everything first and then go to edit it because you're giving yourself three times the amount of work. All right? So that'll be due next Monday. So you would just um, change this to your initials, the name. You would just change the name to your initials on the folder and on the session file. Yeah, let me go over that. So let me close out of this. Yeah, let me just finish this first and then we can get to your question. All right. All right. So we've got this here. Right. And so let's see. I'll do uh, Caitlin as if this was her assignment. So I'm going to see M. And then I'll go in here and I'll change it right here. To CM. And you should do that before you start working on it. This way it's done. You won't have to worry about it later. And then this, you would right click and compress this when you're done. Oh, where did that go? Oh, here it is. And this is what you would upload to Dropbox. And there'll be a folder. You can either upload it to our Google Classroom, um, because I'll put up a note with this assignment, or you could put it in our Dropbox. assignments so there'll be um, a new folder which I'm going to make right now and everybody remembers that next week right we have a class on Tuesday the 29th because Monday is Yom Kippur so Tuesday is the Monday schedule at Queens College So it'll go in this folder. And that's very simple. You just drag it right in there and it will upload. And no, you won't get to keep this here. <laughs> Delete that file. Okay, great. So I'll put up um, an assignment you know, so that'll be listed on Google Classroom. I'll do that tomorrow morning. And I want to go over a couple of other things today. Any questions? Any burning questions? I have a question about the Google Hangout. Yes. Hit the return key. Yeah, if you've got questions, please ask them, type them in as in the chat, ask them. I'm here to help. You know, I'm not here to beat you guys over the head. Uh, let's see, class three. Okay, um, yes, I can show you how to do that. I believe the key command is command shift and the letter L like Larry. Select the section you want to loop, Command-Shift-L. Uh, here, let me show you. But just remember to take it off. Otherwise, things will always loop. So let's say I want to loop this section here. command uh, Let's see what's on the screen. Yeah. Okay, Command-Shift-L. Oh, oops. Command-Shift-L. That's just looping. I, I don't tend to, and then to st stop things, the loop from being selected, you do the same key command. That can be found in the options pull down window, loop playback. Also, another thing too is that for, for the scrolling, this is one thing that we don't talk about. Set it up so that it's on page.
right? What's nice about that, let's say it's, it looks, it's like a book. So if I zoom way in and I play this track, right? So the playback head is going and when it gets to the next section, it flips the page, right? There's this other way that sometimes I see students where it's continuous and this makes me seasick. I don't even know what the use of that is. So um, page. And you can set that up. If it's not working in the edit window down here, MIDI editor, you can click on this downward facing triangle on the upper right hand corner of this window. And you can go to scrolling and set it up to page. So then the same thing will happen down here. So let's say I'm, I'm way zoomed in here. Right, then I play this. It just turns the page. So I'm used to reading books, so that's the way it works for me. Okay. So In today's class, we spent some time on signal flow, an introduction to signal flow. And we've gone over editing timing in the MIDI editor and also uh, length of notes too. Sometimes you want notes to be longer than others. Uh, and this is just the basic basics you can get the stuff the study is really deep all the things you can do with it now a couple of other things i wanted to show you so let's do this i'm going to delete all these tracks for right now we don't need those now see i remembered to switch the screen that time it Let's talk about recording MIDI a little bit more. A couple things I didn't get into last week. Up here is our count off. I typically use something called wait for MIDI, but in the last couple of versions of Pro Tools, this doesn't function correctly. It doesn't work like it should. So now I'm moving into count off. And if you notice here, I've got the count off set to one bar. That's all I need is four beats before I start playing. I prefer to have the way for note, but this is the way it rolls for me. So the way to change the length of the count off is to click on the double click on the metronome and you can have the count off be one bar. And what I would suggest doing is setting it up so that it only counts off during record. Otherwise, every time you play, you'll have one bar before it starts playing. Okay and set your click so that it only plays during record. Otherwise your click will always be playing. You don't need to always be hearing your click. So I'm going to uh, lay down a drum track right now from scratch. Now, if you've got the extended keyboard, you would push this three and it would start the recording. If you don't, it would be command and the space bar. Now, remember that we set up so that spotlight is not working on our music computers. Otherwise, if you do this and you haven't fixed that in your preferences, you're going to get um, the spotlight's gonna come up and you're not gonna be able to do this in Pro Tools. So command and space bar, one, two, three, four. You can't see that. So I just did two bars, right? The hi-hat's a little lower. Let's see. That might work. Okay. So let me open this up. So it's okay. I'm just going to leave this for now. Now, if I wanted to pick up from where I left off and start recording, what you do is you put your playback head where you want to start. 
So let me do this. Two, three, four. And if I wanted to pick up from there, So I recorded, uh, if I wanted to do two more bars, three, four. Well, I did one more bar. So that's how you would continue on. And why this is important is that you don't have to do a perfect take from the beginning to the end. Most of the, the most efficient way to get MIDI notes into any DAW is through a MIDI controller. And most MIDI controllers are keyboards. Now there are some companies that make MIDI controllers that have pads and you could play on those pads to enter things, right? And some people may find that better. And I think for some artists that might be a better workflow. But for me personally, playing things in on the keyboard is what I'm used to and it works really well for me. And that's what we're doing right now in our class. But I'm just letting you know that in the future, you may find a different way of inputting MIDI notes that might work better for you. So if you can't play a take from the beginning to end, you can do things one or two measures at a time. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no cheating. You basically are like a painter and this is your canvas and you're entering notes in to your canvas because your end goal, the painting, the end goal is what you're trying to do here. So let me tell you a little story. Um, if you think of a visual artist, you think of somebody who's got and can draw things incredibly with a pencil and then paint, paint things in beautifully with a brush and do all this stuff with this incredible hand technique. And that's not always true. You know, um, I was friends with a man named Larry Rivers and Larry and I, he, he was a very well-known New York City artist. Um, he was friends with, uh, he, he's been passed away since 2002 and he was about 20 years older than me, maybe older than that. And he um, was an incredibly well-known and successful painter artist and he also played saxophone as a matter of fact he started out playing saxophone and then he um was in world war ii and after world war ii was over he got on the gi bill and he he was touring playing baritone saxophone with a dance band and one of the guys in the band was the husband of a woman named jane freilacker who's a very very famous paint new york city female painter amazing. And Larry got interested in what she was doing because she was with him on the bus, her husband on the bus, and she'd be always drawing and painting stuff, and he got interested. So he took his GI Bill, and he started studying with somebody named Hans Hoffman at the New York School on uh, 8th Street um, between, uh, I think it's between 5th and Broadway or University and Broadway or somewhere over there. It's no longer in existence. It was actually when I was an undergraduate student. But the city's gone undergone such a dramatic change over the, those, over the last bit of time that you won't see it there anymore. So he started studying painting and he was also going to NYU and he became a painter, but he always kept on playing saxophone. So I was in his band. And um, he grew up in a time where all, all these people knew each other, Right. He was, he was friends with Miles Davis. They went to Juilliard together because he was went to Juilliard to play saxophone. And they would practice together in the basements. And he knew Miles Davis his whole, his whole life. He was, friends, he, he was friends with the beat, all the beats like Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, all these famous um, literary figures. And Kenneth Koch, who was an, uh, another uh, poet, they were all friends. They all hung out together. And he, was, he, knew, he knew Thelonious Monk. He used to go three or four. There was this really famous thing where Thelonious Monk, a great jazz pianist, had a residence at the five spot in um, the East Village. And he played five or six nights a week for six months. 
right? And he had John Coltrane in his band for at some point of that run. So Larry's going five or six nights a week, spending a dollar to have a beer, nursing the beer and hanging out with all his friends and hearing Thelonious Monk. And all these people knew each other. <clears throat> so Larry had this... Um, there was a movie called The Quiz Show about all these quiz shows in the early 60s that were all rigged where people were getting fed answers. And and uh, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure if Larry was one of those guys, but he went on something called the $64,000 question. And the topic was art history. And he won $32,000, which in 1960 or whenever he won, it was a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money now, but back then it was like, you know, it's like getting several hundred thousand dollars now or something like that. So he took his money and he was living in these like really beat, run down railroad flat in the East Village somewhere. And he went out to Southampton and he spent like $9,000 and bought a beautiful house out there, paid for it in cash. And he owned this house for the rest of his life. And he would live in the city in the spring, summer, and fall, uh, in the, in the uh, f late fall through the early spring and then out in Southampton for the whole summer. So when we go out, he'd get gigs out there. So I'd go out there and I'd be able to watch him working and he was working on something called the history of the movies and he was commissioned by somebody named jeff jeffrey loria who at that point owned the um montreal expos baseball team and then he owned the miami marlins and now i think he might be one of the owners of the washington nationals it's pos i forget what team he owns now but like incredibly wealthy man and he commissioned him to write this big to draw this big mural so when he was doing this mural, he would make smaller sketches on paper and then transfer each one of those sketches to a larger uh, uh, piece of canvas. And then once those were done, he would transfer those to a much larger piece of canvas. So the way that he did this would be with a projector. So when he was doing his hand sketches, he would take the projector and focus it on his hand sketchers and, 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 and beam the outline of what he was drawing onto the canvas. And he would paint using that as his reference, right? He wasn't like drawing these things in freehand. At the end of the day, it didn't matter. He made these great pieces of art. So if you have to do things when you're recording MIDI information into Pro Tools, the end result is what you're after, right? This is not a live performance. Now, there is something to be said for getting as much of a live performance as you can being more expressive. But if you can't play keyboards really well, how are you going to get stuff in the computer to MIDI stuff, right? You have to learn how to edit and do tricks to get stuff in. So that's one trick there that I just showed you uh, about entering these notes in manual, like one measure, two measures at a time. Let me show you another one. So let's say I want to play a piano part. And let's say I want to play something that's like this. Right? But I can't play that fast because I'm a beginning student. So what do you do? You use the tools available to you inside of a DAW to help you out. Let me show you how you do that. There's a couple of ways at this. So right here is our tempo. And I can click on this and I can add a tempo change. So if I want this piece to be da 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 right? I would tap on the letter T on my keyboard. Ducka 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 ducka. Oh look, my tempo is about 97. So if I wanted to play that, ticka 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 ticka. Right. Well, well, if I can't do that because I don't have the technique on the piano, there's two ways of doing that. Right here is your conductor track. You can turn that off. And this tempo change that you entered before is no longer valid. You get into something called manual tempo. And you can preset a slower tempo that you can play at. So let's say I set this to 60.
I was a little off with the click, but I was able to play that, and then I turned the conductor on. Right? So that's one way that you can do that. All right? So what happens if you can't play both hands on the piano at the same time, right? There's two ways that you can effectuate that. So let me delete this. And I'm going to go to the piano right here, and I'm going to right-click on the name, and I'm going to duplicate. You see a new menu comes up? I'm going to duplicate that track. And I'm going to just, don't worry about all this, just duplicate it. And I'm going to name this Piano, left hand. And then I'm going to go to the previous track and name this Piano, right hand. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and I'm going to slow this down and I'm going to record my left hand on the piano first. One, two, and three, and four, and... Okay, and then now I'm going to record enable the piano right hand. And two, two, three. Oh, and when you're doing this, as it's counting off, I'm going to be playing what are called 16th notes. Ticka, 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 four to the beat. So as this is playing, one E and the, I'm getting that feel. Three E and the, 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 the. Right? Not perfect timing-wise, but we can fix that later. And then we go here, turn our conductor on. All right, so the combination of playing around with the tempo, learning how to break things down into smaller components that you can play, all of these things... Oh, that battery must be dead on my... Nikon, yeah, for two classes. Dumb, bummer. Okay. Let's go. Okay, let's let's move this over here so you can see. <laughs> yeah. Manually switching it. So I've got two cameras and I've got a dummy battery in one. And it didn't last. I thought I charged it completely, but it didn't last for two classes today. Completely. Okay, so... You break things down into small components and you can enter these things in and really get to do things that you couldn't normally think that you could do because you're trying to play everything all at once, right? And I'm hoping that that's clear to you with just this little example. So for ex now, there is another way to do that. And let me just show you. Uh, let's go. Let's go to the screen. Okay, so let me mute this, and we've got our piano right hand. Uh, no, let's actually mute the piano right hand, and then we're going to record on the piano left hand. The other, if you want to have everything on one track, there's one more thing you can do, which is called MIDI Merge, and that is this guy right here. So if you turn that on, that means that you can play on top of this track without erasing the notes there. It's very important that you learn when to turn, always turn this on and off so that you do not erase, you do not keep on adding stuff on top of what you've already played, right? If you wanna do destructive recording and replace something new, you may, gotta make sure this is off, otherwise there'll be duplicate notes on each other and you'll get all sorts of weird issues. So I slow this down and, and the two E and the three E and the four E and the, Right, something like that. Hey, professor, I have a question. Yes, Salida. I can't. I can't see that option. It's like I guess that. Oh, like if you, if you, right. So, free? so yes, yes. So make sure that the conductor track is on. Okay, wait, hold on. Yeah, but the thing is, is that I can't even see the metronome. It's like it's cut off in my in my screen. Oh, like, you know okay, what okay. So give me a second. Let me just let's do this. Okay, no problem. Hold on.
Okay, so share me your screen. Can you do that? Do you know how to do that? No, I mean it's on my it's on another computer. Oh, okay. All right. So so you've got something that looks like this. Correct? Yeah, it's like that. I could only see it a little bit, yeah. All right, so right here. You see where the okay. zoom this is? Yeah, I see it. So get rid of only have MIDI controls and output meters selected. Okay, everything else? Off. MIDI controls. Just MIDI and controls output. and output meters. Okay. And then that should give you a little more space. Yeah, okay. Now I see everything. Thank you so much. Sure. So th that we did go over that a little bit, but that was like that at the end of August. So don't worry. You know, it's hard to remember everything. But this okay, over thanks. here can will customize what you see in the tools here. Okay. Okay. So the other thing too is that, um, no, that does work with the conductor track off. I forget which one. Oh, this doesn't work if you're in loop mode. That's what it is. So if I go into loop mode, no, that does work. I, I forget, there's one mode where this doesn't work. So anyway, you saw how I did that here where I played this on and then I can play it back. And it works fine. Now, what I find MIDI merge most useful for is if you want to have all your drums on one track, doing it with your drums, right? You can have each instrument of the drum on its own unique track, but if you want to have the drums all be on one track, I've just, uh, let me mute everything else. I've got this hi-hat here, right? And let me just uh, quickly fix this. Um, okay, so I've got my hi-hat here and I want to add my kick drum. Now, if I can't play my kick drum at this tempo, right, even though it's only going to be one note on the MIDI keyboard, let me get this uh, angle down here and go there. Even though I'm only going to be doing this, right, if this is too fast to, to play it, you can again use your tempo preset. Right, and I've got my drums there. All right, now if I wanna do another instrument like the cross stick, so let's do this. I'm not going to have that on the downbeat. Uh, I didn't like that, all right? Bad. Command Z, undo. All right, let me do it again. Good, and I can speed that up. All right, so these are different ways with which you can use all of the tools that are available in Pro Tools and Logic, Cubase, Reaper, Ableton. You can do this with all of those. Um, and this is what I meant at the beginning of the class when I said that I teach this so that you take these techniques and you can just use them in your DAW of choice in the future. So now I have, um, before we end class for today, I have a, a question for all of you. Um, so how many of you downloaded the, the demo version of Pro Tools? Can you just type your, just yes or no in the chat? I want to get a count so that I know how many um, iLocks we need to get you people. So far, it's looking like we've got uh, Kate, Caitlin. Christy. 
Right, you're getting pro right. So we, we're all okay. So everybody who's got the demo, right? So we've got one, Chris, two, three, four, or oh, three. Okay, so Chris, you have not been able, you've been having trouble with what exactly? Basically, I, um, like, I had, like, some exchange with uh, Justin, I believe. Yes. But um, I think he was under the impression that I had a Mac, although I um, said more than once that I didn't have a Mac. Um, but I thought that it would be able to be used on Windows. And yes, you should, yes, Pro Tools, you can use Pro Tools on Windows. You can use, that's one reason why we do Pro Tools and not Logic is because you can use Pro Tools on both PC and Mac. Actually, Matthew has Pro Tools running on, on, on PC. So, um, so what we- Yeah, you, I was just having- uh, Do you have it running now? Is that true? Or, yes or no? Oh, no, I don't have it running right now, but I have downloaded the file, I believe. And I just, like, even to decompress it, and stuff, I just, I don't know. It was, it was complicated. I like went on YouTube to see what I can do, but um, I wasn't really successful, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me write this down. What version of Windows do you have? Is it Windows 10? I believe it's Windows 10, yes. I can check. Let me, let me look. So the other thing too is that you have to download not just Pro Tools, but you have to download the um, uh, Air Instruments and expand too. Those are two separate files in your account. So uh, eventually, what's gonna? Hmm, that's interesting. I have to figure out the answer to that. Okay. The we should be able to get you the iLox before this um, expires, but we have Christy, Caitlin, two, John, that's three. Okay, so we've got three of you right now. Yeah, there's a lot of steps that go into the download. I know it should all just be one package, but um, they make it, they make a lot of things difficult for you. You know, Pro Tools used to be owned by this company called DigiDesign, and then Avid purchased them. And Avid makes things so complicated. Um, it's it's. I wish another company would purchase Pro Tools, but that's another story. We can't deal with it. So okay, so I need to get like three or four eye locks for people, and I need to figure out some some way to get Christy some assistance, like as soon as possible, to get this up and running in her computer. All right, so I've got that stuff written down. I'll get on it, and um, that's quite a bit of information for one day. So, um, I think we're gonna call it a day at this point. It's been a couple of hours, and my voice is starting to go from the teaching two classes in a row, where it's just so much talking. So thank you everybody for hanging in there, and I'll, Christy, you're, you're like the priority right now to get you up and running. So I'm going to uh, work on that t tonight and tomorrow morning and see what I can come up with for you. Okay, so I figured out that I have Windows 7, actually, which is, oh, that might this be, is my sister's old laptop. So that, that might be um, part that's of the, that's part, that, I'm going to tell you right now that that might be part of the problem. Okay. So there might be another solution for you. So just let me see what I can do. Thank you. Okay. Everybody have a good day, and I will catch you next Tuesday, all right? All right. Thank you, Professor. Thanks so much. Have a great time. I could have been used it on.